Today, for our story, I'm going to tell you how a retired couple gamed the lottery and grossed $28 million over nine years with mathematical certainty. And for our main topic, I'm going to be taking something that looks like gambling and mathematically twisting it into investing. Essentially, I'm going to use an example to prove the foundation for asset allocation theory. And the results may change the way that you look at investing forever. Good morning and welcome to the Hopefield Financial Podcast. My name is Jay Disberger, your one and only Hopefield Financial Coach, and I'm happy that you're here with us today. Our story begins with Jerry and Marge Selby. This story went mainstream in 2019 when the Selbys were interviewed on 60 Minutes. I have an article pulled up in front of me from CBS News. It's a brief article that goes into the Selby story in an efficient way. The article starts like this. It was a small town story that instantly felt ready-made for the big screen. A retired couple from the Midwest banked millions of dollars by winning various state lottery games dozens of times. No fraud, no scam. The pair did it legally through a mathematical loophole. 60 Minutes first reported on the story of Jerry and Marge Selby in January 2019. Now, their story is a feature film set to premiere on Paramount+. Plus. At this point, I should let you know that I haven't seen the movie myself, but I'm intrigued enough that I will if given the opportunity. High school sweethearts, the Selbys had just sold their convenience store and were living a quiet life in Everett, Michigan, when Jerry spotted a brand new lottery game called Windfall. While reading the fine print, Jerry noticed that the game had a feature called Roll Down. The lottery would announce when it was going to happen. I'm going to momentarily step away from the article because it doesn't tell you how the mathematical loophole worked. And I think it's important to understand. So the way that the windfall lottery worked is there were six numbers on your ticket. Each number ranged between one and 49. So if you had a ticket and all six numbers on your ticket matched what was drawn, you would win the jackpot. But once that jackpot got large enough, they would take it and roll it down into the lower prices. Under normal circumstances, when a roll down wasn't going on, you could have a ticket that matched five out of the six numbers and win $2,500, or four out of the six numbers and win, I think it was $100. And if you had three numbers that matched, you'd win $5. Each ticket cost a dollar, so each prize would be a fair gain. But I think it's when the jackpot hit $5 million, each one of these smaller prizes were multiplied by a factor of 10. So having five numbers that matched up got you $25,000. Having four got you $1,000. And having three matching numbers on your ticket got you $50. And it is that particular feature that is exploitable for this lottery game. Now, Jack Selby saw this and being someone who's mathematically savvy was able to quickly figure out the odds of having a ticket with three or four matching numbers. Effectively, Buying a ticket that would have four matching numbers had a 1 in 1,500 chance. Meanwhile, buying a ticket that would have three matching numbers was roughly 1 in 54. That means in Jack's words, Here's what I said. I said, if I played $1,100, mathematically, I'd have one four-number winner. That's 1000 bucks. I divided 1100 by 6 instead of 57 because I did a mineral quick dirty and I come up with 18. So I knew I'd have either 18 or 19 three number winners and that's 50 bucks each. At 18 I got $1,000 for a four number winner and I got 18 three number winners worth $50 each, that's 900 bucks. So I got $1,100 invested and I've got a $1,900 return. Even if he's really unlucky with that particular approach, I think he's going to end up coming out on top. He'd have to be really unlucky to make a big bet of at least $1,100 and not come out ahead. And this was easy for Jerry because he had a bachelor's degree in mathematics. It's just basic arithmetic, is what he told 60 Minutes. Now this next move is inspiring. After setting up a corporation where he kept detailed records of his winnings, he invited his family and friends to join him in on the lottery payday. When Michigan shut down the windfall game, Jerry set his sights on a lottery game with similar rules in Massachusetts. All told, the Selbys grossed more than $26 million from playing the lottery. Some reports say it's 28, but 
They put their winnings toward renovating their home and helping their grandchildren and great-grandchildren pay for their education. Isn't that downright wholesome? Instead of living it up lavishly and spending this money away on their own desires, they invested in their legacy, in their children and grandchildren, in their education, changing their family tree. To wrap up the story, I want to cover exactly what happened to prevent the Selbys from continuing to game the windfall lottery. Smart people had figured out, if I buy enough of these tickets, I'll always be a winner. I'll get back more than I spent. The paper's reporting revealed that two groups were dominating cash windfall. The Selby gang from Everett, Michigan, in their competition, a syndicate led by math majors from MIT. I don't know what's more surprising, that two groups started gaming the system before it got caught, or the fact that only two groups were gaming the system at this point. The Massachusetts state treasurer shut down the cash windfall game and called for an investigation. When we got involved, the public perception was there must be some kind of organized crime or public corruption. Little did they know it was just a sweet Midwestern couple who was retired and some college students, and they were going about this completely legally. I wasn't surprised. I was dumbfoundedly amazed that these math nerd geniuses had found a way legally to win a state lottery and make millions from it. And the state's getting rich in the process. And and the state got very rich. The state made $120 million. Now, isn't that crazy? So you have the Selbys who made somewhere around $26 to $28 million gross. You have the MIT students who did something closer to 17. And the state was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And after this investigation happened, the game stayed shut down. So the Selbys ended up closing their corporation. Now, I want to be clear. I am not a proponent of playing the lottery because in most circumstances, even if you're trying to buy up a whole bunch of tickets, the odds are not in your favor. The lottery games that are out there are supposed to be built so that the house always wins. They are not an investment avenue under normal circumstances. This was highly unusual the way this windfall game went. When we're making an effort to be wise with our investment dollars so that we can retire with dignity, we want to engage in something that has mathematical evidence that we're going to come out on top. We want something that is very likely going to result in success. You know, that's the point of investing. So what the Selbys did effectively because they understood the math was investing. And that's why for the main topic, we're going to be digging into a little mathematical example, effectively taking something that might look like gambling on the surface and revealing that it is investing. For our main topic today, I want to cover what I call the magical coin game. In essence, it works like this. There's a stranger sitting across the table from you. They have a quarter in hand. They say, I'm going to flip this quarter. Any money that you put down on the table and bet will be doubled if I get heads. If it flips tails, though, I get to keep half the money that you gamble, and I will play this game with you as many times as you want. Well, let's say, for an example, you've got $40 in your pocket. In playing out this example, you bet the $40 and the coin is flipped. You get heads. Well, now your money is doubled. You've got $80. You decide to gamble it all again. The coin is flipped and you get tails. Now you have $40. The coin is flipped for a third time. Now that $40 gets cut in half to $20. Unfortunately, the next coin flip is also tails. So now you're down to $10. Oh, you're so far down. Hopefully you're going to get things doubling again. So you you try it one more time and you get $5. Out of desperation, you try one more time and it gets cut in half, leaving you with $2.50 of your original $40. For some reason, you got tails five times in a row. And while that seems unlikely, that's what happened the first time I tried to work this out. And I decided to try it again. You reach into your wallet, you put down another $40. You say, let's, let's try this all over again. They flip the coin and there's yet another tails. So now you have $20. Your luck's got to change. Coins flipped again, you get heads. All right, you're back to 40. This is good. The coin is flipped for a third time for this iteration, and it's heads again. Yay, you've made $80. On the next coin flip, though, it's tails, and you drop back down to 40. You realize that the odds are not in your favor here. It's random whether you're going to come out ahead or come out behind. And if you were to play this for an infinite amount of time, you're probably going to end up 
with no gain, but you're under the impression that there's an opportunity here. You're determined to try to figure out how to win this coin game. So you try it a third time with a twist. This time you take your $40 and you split it into two groups. One group you bet on the coin flip. The other group you decide to hold on to. You will neither win nor lose with what you hold. So you bet $20, you hold $20. The coin is flipped and it's tails again. So your $20 that you bet becomes 10. The money that you held is still 20. You now have $30. And this is where things get interesting. You ask for change and you redistribute your $30 into two piles of 15. You bet 15, you hold 15. This time you get heads. Now the 15 you bet becomes 30. You have 45 total. You split this up into two equal piles of $22.50. And in working through this example, you get lucky and have heads again. Now, the money that you bet has become $45. You have $22.50 you're holding. This has become $67.50. You split this into two piles, each equal to $33.75. Again, you get heads. The money you bet grows to $67.50. You have $33.75 in your pocket, totaling $101.25. Now, unfortunately, 25 cents does not divide evenly, so you have to pick one pile to have an extra penny. In this case, you decide to hold the extra penny. So you bet $50.62 and you hold on to $50.63. This time you get tails. So the money you bet becomes $25.31, leaving you with a total of $75.94. You split this pile one more time into two piles of $37.97. For the final coin flip of this example, you get heads, doubling your money that was bet to $75.94 leaving you with a total of $113.91. Now, granted, I had more heads than tails when I was working this rebalancing example, but it was the first time that I tried it. I actually went through the example, betting it all every time, four or five times before I got something that was interesting to narrate. Now, working through these anecdotal examples doesn't prove anything. So how about we iterate in a spreadsheet to a point of statistical significance? If you're listening to audio only, I'm going to be working through a spreadsheet now where I basically did the example with the flipping of the coin thousands of times. I decided to use $100 in the spreadsheet just to make the numbers a little easier for me. So in this first iteration, we are gambling $100 up front, and we're going to go through the coin flipping experiment 10 times, and we're going to take whatever the value is after the 10th coin flip and put it here at the top of this data table. Each one of these instances in this column is the result from doing the experiment of 10 iterations. There are a thousand trials total in this column, meaning that I flipped a coin in the spreadsheet virtually 10,000 times to get this histogram. And if you're watching the video, you'll just see the histogram represents a normal bell curve. It's statistically normal and centered around $100. Oddly enough, because there's a 50-50 shot of heads or tails, what ends up happening in the really long run, on average, is the value will bounce up and down and center around the initial invested amount. Did I say invested? I meant gambled. So the most likely outcome is you walk away with what you started with. However, there's equal odds that you end up growing it to some amount, and the further you grow it, the less likely it is or that you end up walking away with less. And the smaller amounts, like ending with zero, is the least likely. And since it's a bell curve, there's a 50-50 chance that you fall on either side of the $100. You're either gonna make money, you're gonna lose money. There is no mathematical advantage to playing this game this way. So let's change up the example and make it a little bit more interesting. Okay, the top part of the spreadsheet looks a little more complicated, but I'm effectively taking the $100, splitting it into two piles, holding onto one and betting the other one. And after the result of the coin flip that follows the, the betting, I'm going to take my money, pool it together and rebalance it. You can see that after the first coin flip that's above me right now, the coin was tails. So the $50 that was bet becomes 25. I get 75 and I split that into two piles of 37.50 in a, before the next coin is flipped. And I think it's very funny that the live example at the top of the spreadsheet right now was very unlucky. There were only two heads that doubled the money through the whole thing. But the unlucky sequence here only ended with $22.53. And I think this exemplifies that by rebalancing, we are really chopping off the low end of 
losing money. In the last simulation, it was quite possible that you end up with less than $10. Meanwhile, in this simulation, ending up with less than $10 is radically unlikely to the point that we don't even see it populate on this iteration of the histogram. Now, if you can see the video, I'm just going to toggle between the histograms so that you can appreciate how the bell curve has changed. The original situation was a pretty even bell curve. With the rebalancing, though, we see that the likely outcome has significantly shifted to the positive. In fact, the median of our new histogram is at $180.20. And that's for a game where we started with $100, meaning that the median outcome is a gain. And looking at this histogram here, it looks like there's 20% chance or less that we end up losing money playing the game this way. And there's an 80% chance-ish that we end up gaining money. I think that means that if we continued to play the game this way, even if we had unlucky stretches, our likelihood of making money goes up. So if we played more than just 10 times, we're probably going to approach certainty that we will make money. Okay, so the first time this particular statistical reality was explained to me, it hurt my head. I still actually have a hard time wrapping my mind around this, and it makes me a little angry. I have two situations where the median of both, either holding on to the money or gambling everything, is what I start with. If I hold on to the money, I'm for sure going to end the experiment with what I started with. And if I gamble everything, the statistical likelihood is that I walk away with roughly the same amount that I started with in the gambling example, right? And there's a 50-50 shot that I either gain or that I lose. But if I simply reorganize my money between these two actions, which each independently have a likelihood of no net gain over multiple iterations, I end up generating a revenue. And that blows my mind. This here, right now, can be somewhat explained by saying the two pools, either holding the money or betting the money, are inversely correlated to an extent. Not perfectly. They don't go up and down by the exact same amount. But when your money grows, that was put on the table, the money in your pocket does not. So there's an inverse correlation there. And when you lose money on the table, the money in your pocket is not lost. In essence, it looks like a relative gain there's an inverse correlation there. And by rebalancing between the two, there is a statistical likelihood that you gain money over time, that you have a return. And it's my understanding that this is the foundation to asset allocation theory. This is why investing professionals will say, even though equities on average, as a rule of thumb, outperform bonds, it can be wise to have a balance between equities and bonds if they are inversely correlated to each other. If they likely do the opposite of each other, depending on inflation or market circumstances, then by rebalancing between the two, you can generate a return that is greater than the arithmetic average between the two pools if they were acting on their own independently. Now, there's a lot more complexity when we're talking about the actual investments, and I'm not saying that you have to go out there and rebalance between two different things. The point of the example that I have here, even though it's simple, is a mathematically clean way to illustrate that rebalancing can statistically increase your likelihood of gain. However, there are two things this doesn't prove. This doesn't prove how a portfolio that's rebalanced between two inversely correlated investments is going to behave during accumulation versus distribution. In the example, we had a lump sum and we watched how it behaved while it was rebalanced. We weren't talking about adding money to the pool or taking money out. It's possible that by introducing a behavior, in addition, we can alter the statistics. And it's important to note that a good rule of thumb is that the things that are true for the accumulation phase of your life are going to be the opposite in the distribution phase. Mathematics gets turned on its head when you go from putting money into a portfolio to taking money out. And this is a topic that we're going to be exploring more in future episodes in the podcast. So please like, follow, share, and subscribe if you don't want to miss it. And until next week, until next Tuesday, budget bravely and enjoy your hope-filled financial future. Mm -hmm.